Hi, I'm Jalen Rose, and welcome to the Renaissance Man podcast, proudly presented by the New York Post, a show where we cover trends in fashion, entertainment, current events, and everything in between. My next guest is a Jamaican dancehall recording artist, love and hip hop star, and businesswoman who is considered dance hall royalty. Her 2018 mixtape called Captured only peaked to number one on Billboard's reggae album chart, and her debut album 10 was Grammy nominated in 22 for best reggae album. This lady is a pioneer of dance hall music across the world and went through the reclaiming the rights of her music, all while never forgetting where she came from. It is my honor to welcome a true queen, Spice, to the Renaissance Man Show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the love. Thank you for taking the time. And happy Mother's Day. Thank you so much. Thanks, happy and happy Mother's Day to your mother as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And following you on Instagram, the videos with you and your children, just talk about what was it like celebrating Mother's Day? Oh, it was beautiful. I mean, I laughed. I cried. Got mm. emotional. Replaying the videos and watching them. Um, it's a beautiful thing. And just looking back at how far I'm coming from, my um, kids, they're all grown up now. And I'm like, oh, my God, I really did it. Because, <laughs> you know, at first we had to figure it out. But when they got when they have grown up so much, he's like, you're you're just it's just an unexplainable feeling of just watching them throughout the years. And at this moment to know where, you know, we're coming from. Well, well deserved. I had to make sure I said that. Um, also, can you please give me a snapshot of what it was like growing up in Jamaica and how it shaped you? Um, growing up in Jamaica was hard for me. I came from humble beginnings. Um, my slogan now is from homeless to greatness because I remember when I was younger and I came home, my house was gone. I lost my home to fire. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so I basically lost everything. I only had one pair of shoes and the uniform that I went to school with that day. That was all I was left with. And so I was able to, you know, bounce around from house to house, trying to figure it out. Me and my mom, my five siblings and I, and that's just humbling for me because I feel like that also has molded me and shaped me into the strong person that I am. Because oftentimes, even now in my adult life, I got to make sure I know how to make these no's into yeses. And that's just a lot of lessons that I've, I've learned growing up. But I really come from humble beginnings and I'm super excited to see where I'm at right now, to see where God have placed me in this lifetime because I'm really coming from nothing. I'm self-made also. I don't have a management team or anyone. I'm doing this as a, you know, independent woman right now. So I'm super excited. I'm humbled. I'm grateful, grateful to God for where I'm at right now. God is good all of the time. And I admire you. And I'm very happy that you're on the show because so many times people see the result or the residue of your That's hard work but they can't necessarily appreciate when you were bouncing from house to house with your siblings and your mom. So please give us a snapshot of what those years were like. Um, when I, when I became homeless, um, the first place I went was with my godmother, the Smiths family, um, Christian home. Cause you know, I was a little Christian girl. I don't know what happened along the way, but I was very, uh, <laughs> I was brought up in a Christian home. So I was living with my godparents. Um, when I became homeless and they took very good care of me. Um, shout out to the Smiths family. Um, after that, I went back to live with my mom when she became more stable. Um, that's in old Brayton. A part of my life. I also went to England because my grandfather was trying to help my mother. So I was the grandchild that he sent for to go to England to live because we were so poor. And, you know, my mother was struggling with my siblings and I, and he was like, I'm going to send for one of the child. And, I was lucky enough to be one of the ones that was chosen and I went to England, um, but I just couldn't adapt to the culture at the time. When I went to England, I was about 11 or 12 years old um, and the culture was just so different and I was crying. I want to go back home. I want to go home. Like, I want to go back to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. 
um so i've had um great i i don't regret anything that happened in my childhood everything that has happened has really kind of just molded me into the woman that i am today my father died when I was only nine years old. He's the reason I'm in music, because I remember before he died, he used to play like Bob Marley song in the house and Professor Nuts and, you know, he used to tell us to sing the songs and he would give us extra food on the plate. And I used to, I, I love my belly, so I used to sing for food. <laughs> I used to sing for food in the house. And that's really how my career started at home before my father died at nine years old. So my story so long, I know I'm talking all uh, the different parts, but each part of my upbringing has really molded me and shaped me into who I am. And it totally makes sense in your post when you say Spice Marley. That, yes. That, 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 to <laughs> that totally makes sense. So enlighten us on what it was like when you were introduced to music by your dad, rest in peace, but falling Thank in you. love with it and making it, making yourself know that, hey, this may be something I could do as a career? So um, we used to sing the Bob Marley songs. My father was a Rasta man. And so he used to play the Bob Marley, the Professor Nutt song. And I used to know them word for word. And I think he heard the talent in me because I was like the only one in the house who used to just be singing them, singing them. And he was amazed. And he used to look at me and say to me, you're a star. You're going to be a star. My daughter can sing. And I remember him just speaking life into me and how he was very boastful about me to his friends. Like everywhere he would take me and he would be, my daughter can sing. My daughter is a singer. My daughter is a star. And so he always told me that I'm going to become a singer. So funny enough, I started out doing reggae, not dancehall, because that's what my father taught me. Mm -hmm. So I used to sing, you know, very nice songs. I'm telling you, the fans is responsible for where I went down the future. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to sing like very nice reggae songs until I discovered dancehall when I become older, when I became older. Like um, I remember when I was starting to come out of the house and I used to hear like the, the, the faster pace dancehall, the beats and the drums. And I discovered dancehall outside of my home because they never used to play dancehall in my home. It was reggae. Mm -hmm. When I discovered dancehall and I started knowing about Bone to Killer, Ninja Man, I was like, no man, that is me like. Mm -hmm. So that's really where my love for dancehall grew in the streets. Mm -hmm. When I started to go to like street parties, street events and stuff like that. And funny enough, it was in my community in Old Bridge and Crescent Lane where Spice was born. Because I was about 14 years old and they were having this big sound like a, a, a dance hall party in the streets and i remember bounty killer was on the show baby sham was on the show a lot of artists was on the show and i feel like that was my moment and i walked up on the stage i remember and bounty killer was like who who is this little girl <laughs> at 14 years old and he handed me the microphone and i always i'm just so humbled and grateful to him i'm always happy got bounty killer and i thank him because he's the first person to hand me a microphone to music and that's where spice was born in old britain in my community i started to spit lyrics and we started to go back and forth with power man and a lot of them that was on the stage and i think that's where he earned the respect for me as a little girl and he looked at me and he said to me i remember you are going to be the next queen of dance hall wow and incredibly you go on to be nominated for a grammy so absolutely to me more please about rapping and battling alongside other male artists since you were a teenager um i feel like that bravery came from my dad because also i'm born to kill as well because the life that he was just breathing into me the the the, the boastfulness the way how he was like you're talented you're bad you're gonna be this you're good you know what i'm saying i was just so confident and right. to put the icing on the cake when I met Bounty Killer, how he was so receptive and spoke life into me, like telling me you're going to be the next queen of dance hall. At that point, at my age, nobody could tell me different. Nobody could talk to me because <laughs> the person that was ahead of the dance hall genre is telling me that you're so good. So I feel like that gave me confidence and I took it and I ran with it. And I was challenging a lot of male artists in the business. I remember clashing a lot of people going up against Elephant Man at the peak of his career, going uh, up against Beanie Man, Beanie Man at the peak of his career. You know, the first time at 14 when I walked onto stage, Born to Kill Out, we were going back and forth lyrically. Uh -huh. So that's really how I got my recognition and ratings in dancehall. 
from a teenager. That is incredible. You was putting in your work, no doubt about it. For those that have never been to Jamaica, can you give them a glimpse of what Jamaican culture is actually like? Absolutely. That's easy. Beautiful beaches, the ambience itself, um, the, tr the greenery, the trees, the food is something to um, die for. Like our culture is so impactful when it comes on to our music, the dance hall music. If you go to the dance hall, you're going to see people cooking food on the streets in a jerk pan. You know, they're making your jerk chicken right outside. You know, they're selling peanuts. You know, their soup is being bought cooked in front of you in a, in a cold stove and a big pot of fire. So you get the food right there in front of you on the street, the jerk pork, the jerk chicken, the soup. If you go to the beaches, it's beautiful. There's so many things, the music that's playing. The people in general, the language that we have um, in Jamaica, the patwa talking, is so unique. You know, our people are funny. They're loving, they're embracing you. So the whole ambience in Jamaica is going to feel, you know, like you're in a different world. Because usually people only talk about the ganja. That's all they ever <laughs> talk about. <laughs> no, we're known for more than the ganja. We have good ganja, I know, but we're known for more than <laughs> the ganja. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. When, when did you get the call about some reality show that you've become a star of called Love and Hip Hop? Um, I'm a friend. I'm friends with Stacey Trung, who's from Jamaica. And she's friends with Mona Scott Young. And Mona Scott Young called her and they were coming to Jamaica. I remember it was season six. And they were like, since Spice is the queen of, you know, Jamaica, we want her to show the girls around the country. You know, we want to come to one of her performances in Montego Bay. And that's how the relationship started. Mm. However, when I did that one season, I was like, mm, this is pretty interesting. They're on a major platform internationally. Oftentimes, we're still trying to become internationally known. So I feel like this is a good way for me to use the franchise so people can put a face to the name Spice because I know that a lot of people know Spice at the time, but people would be able to get more involved in my personal life and, you know, to know who is this girl from Jamaica. And so I got very interested um, when, when I did that one episode. I was like, I feel like this is something I can do. And I just, you know, reached out to them and let them know I want to be a part of it. And I did my interview just like anyone else um, to go on Love and Hip Hop, shared my story, told them what it was. And everybody, the executives that was at the table was super, super interested. I remember I lied in the interview because at the time you had to live in Atlanta. <laughs> and so they were like, you're from Jamaica. How are you going to film? And I'm like, no, man, my move. But then I'm in Atlanta, I'm leave now. <laughs> At the time, I, I did not know anyone from Atlanta. I was staying in a hotel until I figured it out. So, I mean, that's the only lie I, I told in that interview that I already moved. I'm move, man. I'm leave Atlanta. <laughs> right. I'll get the job. I'll be here today. No problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, now, the one thing about the camera is that it's always rolling. So we get a chance to see the good days, the bad days. Can you acknowledge maybe some friendships that you've carried from the show and maybe some beefs that you carried from the show? Um, friendships and beefs would definitely be Tommy that was on the show. Um, I was friends with her. We did a song together. Then we started beefing over the song. But um, I've learned that she's just a unique person. And you just have to learn to understand her. And I feel like I myself am unique as well. And so sometimes there are people will have misconception because of my language, mm -hmm. you know. And so I feel like that's one person that I have, you know, friendship and beef with. But also Estelita is a friend that I met on the show and she's still my friend to this day. She's actually one of my best friends. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've met a lot of good, great friends on the show. Mimi is still my friend. Oh, my God. Rashida is still a great friend of mine on the show. Shekinah is my great friend. So I've met so many friends on, on the show. I want to give you a date. There was something very special that happened in your life. Can you acknowledge oh. what happened for you on May 5th, 2023? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it was a historical day. It's not a date that I will ever forget. I was honored by 15 or 16 different mayors, 
vice mayors and commissioner with the keys to the region in mm. Borard, Florida. And that was super amazing. Thank you so much. I'm so humbled. Um, has never been done before. And I feel like it started out with Marlon Bolton, who wanted to give me the keys to the city. Um, mm. And when he started reaching out to like other mayors and other commissioners and vice mayors, everybody was like, oh, we love what Spice is doing. You know, we want to give our keys to the city as well. You know, and that's where the idea came from for all the 16 of them to come together and give me the keys to the region all together. And it meant a lot to me that, you know, the seeds that I'm planting, you know, I'm kind of reaping the benef benefits that people are seeing and it's being impactful because one of the things that they also mentioned was the fact that they know I have my Grace Hamilton Women Empowerment Foundation and I give back to the community. Last year, I was able to give back five million um, wow. worth of book vouchers um, to kids and mothers from the community. So I've been doing a lot of, you know, philanthropy, philanthropy work and I'm just super grateful for the honor. Um, to get the keys to the region as the first person to have gotten it from 16 different um, vice mayors, commissioners, um, execs. What what a wonderful honor. And for you, I'm pretty sure it meant a lot more because you were coming back into the limelight after a serious medical scare in November of 2022. What is Absolutely. your new outlook on life after a major struggle like that? Is life richer now? literally and figuratively absolutely um life for me is better it's so much better because every time i talk i'm not crazy i say this is my second life and it literally is because last year i feel like i lost my life and i was given a second chance to life mm -hmm. and so when i speak to people i'm like you know in my first life and they're looking at me like is she crazy no i'm not crazy mm -hmm. i literally was given a second chance to life and I refer to my current life as my second life mm. because last year when the sepsis attacked my body, it started eating my organs. Mm. Um, it attacked my lungs. I couldn't breathe on my own. Um, it ate away my entire skin. I had no belly. Like it's just so many things going through my head that is just unexplainable what I saw, what I witnessed, what I went through. And I just got a taste of God and just to witness how great he is, just to watch that come back you know, like it wasn't even there. I just have to big up Father God and, you know, Jesus is my king and I'm so grateful for this journey. But in my second life, for the question that you asked, I'm more humble, I'm, I'm more forgiving, I'm, I have a calmer spirit. I remember things that used to bother me in my first life. It doesn't bother me now in my second life. And the little things that I used to take for granted, I no longer take it for granted. Mm -hmm. I'm more forgiving because I remember in my first life, if somebody does me something i'm like attacking them all out like i don't like this person i'm not talking to this person i'm i'm not like that anymore i'm now able to pray for them i'm now able to forgive them i'm more yeah. humbled because i realized i i knew before that you could be here today and be gone tomorrow mm -hmm. the fact that i have tasted it i've experienced death mm -hmm. you know i'm more humbled mm -hmm. and i'm not bothered about like things that I used to be bothered about anymore. A lot of things don't really bother me anymore. Well said, and God is good all of the time. And if you don't mind, I'm going to adopt that to the rebirth part of this. And yes. my second life, I turned 50 recently in January. And for me, that was like a milestone. It is. Rebirth in a lot of ways. And you Absolutely. just gave me, you just gave light to it for me because I, adopted all of the things that you just said just as a man just as a human being of not allowing things to consume me aided I yes. can't control and or just like not holding grudges okay and I'm grateful that I was able to just inspire that mindset just to spark it a little bit but another thing that I'd like to add to it was when I was laying in the hospital on the bed and the infection, the sepsis that was taking over my body was over 3,500. They've never seen it before. And to be honest, they wasn't sure if I was going to survive, if I was going to live. I remember one of the doctors called my sister to come say goodbye to me. That's how bad it was. Um, so when I was laying in the hospital, I started to think of the many things that I have accomplished and the many things that I have but that I'm going to leave them behind. And I was wondering, oh my God, did I do insurance? Did I have life insurance for my kids? Did I do this? Like I was really planning my death. Wow. But 
I say this to say that we always need to remember that we are going to leave this world with nothing. So nothing should be a bother to us. Mm -hmm. that's what I'm going to say. So if you're having any problems, if you're having any issue, just remember that when we leave, we're not leaving with anything. So little things don't bother me anymore. I love that. And I appreciate how in particular on social media, you live your glory. You into yeah. shopping, you into making sure you got the designer bags and the, 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 the car theme speakers, <laughs> you know, Yes. <laughs> Talk about, I was taking about care of myself partner. yesterday. What? I was I was taking care of myself for Mother's Day. Um I took myself shopping for Mother's Day. Yes. I remember you asked what did I do for Mother's Day. I took myself shopping and I was just excited to get the little things. I remember walking into Porsche and the car was there and I was excited, but I was like, I don't have no money to buy this Porsche. I'm not going to no mall to buy a Porsche. But I saw a little poor speaker that I could use for my music and I got so excited. <laughs> and the guy started playing my music. I'm like, I'll second for the speaker. And then he, sh he showed me a little luggage. And I was like, I can't afford the luggage. I'll second for the luggage. <laughs> so I was, I was having fun. I enjoy doing little stuff like that. Absolutely. And music is the soundtrack of life. So I have to ask, besides yourself, name your top five dance hall artists. Oh. Wow, that's one of the hardest questions. Uh, yeah. Can it be 10? <laughs> sure, as many as you can, but definitely your favorite five, your top five. All right. Um, there's so many. Before I name my top, I just want you to know that there's so many people outside of the top people that I rate and love that is super talented and that's great. Dancehall is full of a lot of talent. But if you ask the question to name my top people, um, it would definitely have to be Bounty Killer. Mm. Um, you know, he started my career. Definitely Bounty Killer. Ninja Man. Because mm. sometimes, you know, me have a little Ninja Man in me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and he, Ninja Man, used to call me on stage as well um, in the early part of my career. It would definitely have to be Vibes Cartel. Because, you know, he gave me my first international record with Rampin' Shop. So mm. big up to the Gaza Nation boss, Vibes Cartel. Baby Sham gave me my first hit song with Fight Over Man. That's with Dave Kelly. Mm. And mm, Shaggy. Yes. I refer, to, I refer to Shaggy as my hero because he was able to take me out of a record deal that I was stuck with for 10 years mm. and ended up giving me also one of my bigger, biggest collab today, which has over 200 billion streams. Like it's doing so great. My song go down there with Shaggy and Sean Paul. So it would definitely have to be um, Shaggy and Sean Paul. But you know, more true and couple more people. <laughs> Maria Shaba, Maria Shaba. Um, I feel like, you know, me love Shaba. Um, that's, that's and and then there's so many. That's a, historic, that's a historic list right there. And I was going to ask you about having your album produced by Shaggy. What was that like? And talk to me more about how he helped you as an artist with those business dealings. Because I know being an artist, it can be tough yep. to try to own your masters and all of that stuff. Right. I think the first thing I learned from Shaggy was that losses are lessons. Hmm. I never forget when he said that. I feel like Shaggy and I are similar in we've lost so much when it comes on to like being in the music business and you put things together and you probably just walk away from it. Our people do so many things to you. The only difference with Shaggy and I is that I'm very vocal. I'm very opinionated with what happened to me. So if you do something to me, mm -hmm. everybody are going to come up on social media and talk about it. <laughs> Shaggy <laughs> Shaggy's a man that will deal with it behind closed doors and you'll never know. Mm -hmm. But he has lost so much in the business. He has, you know, sacrificed so much. And sometimes when he's telling me the story, I'm listening like, oh, like, wow, you've been through this. Like this happened to you and you've handled it so very well. You know, I, I, I wouldn't be able to do it. Everybody would have known come here if talk about it. Like, right. um, I just learned to deal with issues better. And I think that's one thing that I, I, I took from Shaggy because... I was arguing with VP Records to get me out of the record label for 10 years, wow. back and forth. 
and I wasn't, no matter what, I wasn't able to come out of the deal. And Shanky was like, let's do it this way. And he stepped in, asked what the issue was. And he said, I'll produce the album, you know, I'll produce the album and give it to you. And I guess it was easier, maybe because of Shaggy. Because me. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's, he made it seem so easy, but I was so grateful. Absolutely. Are we going to get more of you on Love and Hip Hop in Atlanta? Um, Definitely. We are actually moving to MTV. So mm -hmm. when we come back, we're going to be, we start on June 13 and we start on MTV every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. I'm super excited for it. This season in particular is more special to me because not that I haven't shared my personal life on TV before, but because of my death scare, mm -hmm. the, the fact that they're capturing it, the fact that, you know, my health scare is, is going to be detailed. I'm sharing information that I would not normally share with the public. Everything about this season of Love and Hip Hop is going to be a special season for me because I've, I'm, I'm being so vulnerable to the world with my personal you know, life. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your openness, your honesty, your talent, your humor, your candor. It's very refreshing to not only meet you and interview you, but I appreciate you for taking the time, Spice. But before I let you get out of here, I got a okay. rapid fire segment called Ghana 60 Seconds. You ready to do this? Okay. <laughs> this is going to be a tough one for you. What is you the so? best place? to get Jamaican food, and what are you ordering? The best place to get Jamaican food is a restaurant called Living Room Bar and Dining in Jamaica. So when they offer three Kingston, find Living Room Bar and Dining. I need to hit that up. What city or country that you've performed in has your favorite crowd? Jamaica. After Jamaica, I mean, <laughs> I feel like I've traveled the world and I met a lot of people. But when me there, me yard, I'm a hometown, I can't talk my natural Jamaican patois language to my people and just be myself. That just hits home for me. Um, Jamaica, I would say, is my favorite place to perform. And we talked about the Porsche speaker you just purchased. Is there <laughs> another nice thing that you're eyeing that you want to treat yourself to soon? Um, maybe another house. You never know. I just yes. want to have another house, but maybe another house. Yes, yes. Love it. Love it. Real estate never goes out of style. Last, exactly. But certainly not least, you keep reaching goal after goal. So what is next for Grace Spice Hamilton? What is next for me and a goal that I'm trying to achieve is to make sure that this all female project that I'm doing will be historical. Mm. And um, I'm gonna use the word historical because I, I just want to make sure that we open so many doors for these females that, because I'm working on a female rhythm to mm. just have all females together. And I'm being very meticulous about it because I wanna make sure that it's major, that it's massive. That's the goal that I'm working on right now because I want to give back to women in dancehall music. I wanna give back please, to them. Please, please tease that a little bit. When do you want it to come out? Who are some of the people that you wanna have on it? Um, so I, pr I placed it on my Instagram, which is at Spice Official because I want people to reach out to me. I've, 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 I've had over 250 emails just in a day. So I need to know that there were so much female artists, you know, out there. So I'm going through the list right now, trying to figure out how I'm going to record so many people. I know it's impossible, but mm -hmm. I don't know who's going to be at on the rhythm as yet. But I know it's going to be great because I'm going to take my time with it. I wanted to release it this summer. I'm not sure if it's going to be done by summer, but I'm going to document it. And so everybody will get a walk into how I managed to pull it off. That's incredible. And I'm going to make sure... I come watch you perform, especially Absolutely. if you're gonna be in Jamaica. I need to see this. That's that's historic. Absolutely, uh, anytime. <laughs> it would be my honor. Thank you very much for taking the time and joining the Thank show. You. Thank you.